So I'm going to switch gears a little bit today. We had started a series last week called The Genesis of Christmas, and sometimes as a preacher, uh, you have an idea for a series, and you, and you make plans, and you make outlines, and then as the day approaches, it's something just feels a little bit off. It doesn't feel right. I guess sometimes maybe that's just the Holy Spirit nudging you to go in a different direction. And so I kind of changed plans at the last minute this week. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, I've been listening to this series by a preacher named Timothy Keller. How, do you guys know who Timothy Keller is? Uh, he's a Presbyterian pastor in New York City. He's the author of many books. If you go to the Christian bookstore, you've probably seen his face. But uh, I've been listening to one of his series on generosity, and it's just been really speaking to my heart. And so just wanted to share with you a little bit about generosity today. I'm going to be pulling a little bit from that Timothy Keller series And so we're talking about generosity, and we're going to tie it into how it relates to the Christmas story a little bit, because as we mentioned last week, of course, from a secular point of view, that's kind of what the Christmas season is is all about, isn't it? From from the non-churched and the non-Christian point of view, the Christmas season is really all about generosity and sharing joy and spreading Christmas cheer and and good tidings, right? And, And of course, that stems from the the original reason that we celebrate Christmas, which is God's generosity to us. God sending us a gift uh, that we didn't deserve, sending His Son into the world. Um, And that's kind of the the idea of Christmas, is that God is generous to us, and He gave us this great gift, namely His Son. And so the Christmas season is really a perfect time to talk about generosity. Um, And so as we talk about it, what's the, probably for most of us, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you mention the word generosity? Probably money, right? Money is what we typically think of when we think about generosity. But generosity, especially biblical generosity, involves a lot more than just money, doesn't it? It involves uh, our day-to-day actions. It involves our day-to-day interactions with other people. It involves what goes on in our heart. It is a state of mind, and it is a way of life, right? Generosity. And so biblical generosity, or Christ-like generosity, is much more than just giving away your money, isn't it? In fact, it's something much deeper, and it's something much more difficult to put into practice than just writing a check, (laughs) In fact, it's possible to be very, very generous financially and not actually be a generous person, isn't it? That's entirely possible. You could be insanely generous financially. You could give away millions of dollars. You could give away every dime you've ever made. You could be the most financially generous person in the world. You could be a person that other people look at and say, wow, what a generous person. Yet, in reality... You could actually not be a generous person. How is that? It's because you can write a check, you can put money in the offering plate, but you can do so without a sincere heart or without a humble heart, can't you? You can do it for the wrong reasons. And so you can have acts of generosity without actually being a generous person. You can give for selfish reasons, can't you? A lot of folks give for selfish reasons. First of all, you can get pretty nice tax breaks in our society, right? I, I'm on the board for Christian Financial Services, and we have a few donors who have just told us we really only give for the tax breaks. They don't really care about the mission. They just want the tax breaks. And it's like, okay, well, we'll take your money, but, you know, we're not, we're not going to turn away your money, but... But you can give for selfish reasons, can't you? Uh, You can give so that others might look at you as a generous person. You might give for status reasons so that others may look at you and it makes you feel good about yourself. You like that affirmation from others, knowing that others see you as a generous person. You might give, uh, maybe if you're a particularly deceitful person, (laughs) you could give uh, generously. Uh, to use it as leverage in your relationships, right? So that you can hold it over people. Well, remember, I did this for you. And so you have to do me a favor, right? And we can hang it over their heads for a while. 
And so there's a lot of ways we can give selfishly. We can also give with a proud heart, can't we? Pride is actually a factor in our generosity sometimes. Giving, helping someone without actually valuing the person that we're helping. Right? Giving uh, without taking someone else's needs and making them more important than your own needs. And so Christ-like generosity can look very different from the kind of generosity that we see in the world, which looks very generous on the outside, but lacks what Christ desires often on the inside. And so we're going to talk about what it looks like to have Christ-like generosity, or what is really a radical generosity, because if we were really as generous as Christ, we would be the most radical person on earth, wouldn't we? And so we're talking about a radical generosity here is what we're talking about. So let's take a look at a couple passages from the Gospel of Luke. If you have your Bible or your phone app, go ahead and turn to the Gospel of Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke, third book in your New Testament. By the way, Luke is the gospel with the the longest Christmas story. So if you're looking for the Christmas story, you can turn to Luke. So this is a a story about a parable that Jesus shares about a Pharisee and a tax collector. Okay? Before we read this passage, we're going to be in Luke chapter 18. But before we read this, it's important to understand the context of a Pharisee and a tax collector at the, in this time in Israel. So Pharisees, although now as Christians in 2019, we look at Pharisees in a negative light, don't we? Because Jesus is always rebuking them. Jesus is always calling them out. Jesus is always making them look foolish in front of others. And so we, because we've had the privilege of reading Jesus' words for 2,000 years, we look at Pharisees in a negative light. But actually in in the society in Israel at the time, Pharisees were, they were looked upon pretty well. They had favor with the people. They were the religious leaders. They were the pastors of sorts. And so they were respected, right? And so you have a Pharisee, a well-respected religious leader, and then you have a tax collector. And if you know anything about tax collectors in Israel at the time, they were considered really kind of like the lowest form of scum that a human could reach. And and I'm almost not overstating it when I say that. Here's why. The Roman Empire came into Israel and oppressed the people, didn't they? They took over. They they charged them these outrageous taxes. They oppressed the people. They did the Romans did basically whatever they want wanted to the Israelites. And the tax collectors who st- who basically robbed the people of money and took these outrageous amount of taxes, they were not Romans. The tax collectors were Israelites, Jews. It was their own people who had turned and started working with the Romans out of greed. And so they said, hey, Romans, I'd like a cut of that money. Let me take money from my own people, overcharge them so that I could pocket some, and I'll work with you. So it's a, it's a, an, a person in the oppressed people group working for those who were oppressing them and using it for selfish reasons. And so tax collectors were not only greedy, but they were, they were traitors to their own people. And so tax collectors were, were looked upon uh, as, as the, the lowest of low, right? And so you have a Pharisee in one hand, and you have a tax collector in the other hand. Two contrasting characters at the start of the story, okay? So this is where we jump in. It says, Luke chapter 18, verse 9, it says, "...to some who were confident of their own righteousness..." And look down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. (laughs) Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. 
I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. If you've grown up in church, you've read this story before, but try to imagine yourself as a first-time hearer of this in Israel. This is a really kind of shocking parable for the original hearers. Again, you have a religious leader, a, a, a reputable man, and a scum, scoundrel tax collector. And Jesus says, guess what? It's the tax collector who will be justified before God, not the Pharisee. And you know their, their mouths just dropped. What? How can this be? Right? How can this possibly be? How can this greedy traitor be justified before God? Here's why. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the tax collector recognized that he was a sinner in need of a Savior. And the Pharisee did not. The Pharisee may have done all the things on the outside that looked good. Other folks would have looked at him and said, wow, what a great guy. He gives away a tenth of all of his money. He prays every day. He's memorized all the scriptures. But on the inside, he was bankrupt and prideful and arrogant. And he did not recognize the need for a Savior. So as we talk about generosity, we see in this passage a couple of things that we can take note of. Sincerity and humility. Sincerity and humility. Let's talk about humility for a second. The, the story, Luke starts off by just telling us why. We don't, this doesn't happen very often. He tells us why Jesus told the parable. He says, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. So Luke tells us right off the bat, Jesus is telling us this parable specifically for people who lacked humility, is what he's saying. For overconfident people who look down on others, Jesus was talking to them. And so this is a story, firstly, about learning a lesson in humility, isn't it? The Pharisee, again, is portrayed as someone who lacks humility. He goes out and he prays and he says, Thank you, Lord, that I'm so great. Basically, that's his prayer, right? No humility whatsoever. Not only that, but clearly he's desiring affirmation from God and from others. He wants to be affirmed. He wants to be adored. He wants praise from God and from others. That is, again, a lack of humility. He wants people to see how amazing he is. <laughs> and the point in the end is, Jesus says, if you exalt yourself, like this man, if you exalt yourself before God and before men, you will be humbled. But, if you, like the tax collector, humble yourself before God and before men, in the end, you will be exalted. And so we have these contrasting things going on here. And this is important as we think about generosity because it can be easy to fall into the temptation of doing generous things just so that other people will see it. That's an easy temptation for us to fall into, isn't it? To be generous so that you can give your status a little bit of a boost or so that you can, maybe you don't even care about what others think, but so you can feel better about yourself, so that you can build up your own ego and your own pride and you can think to yourself, hey, I'm a really great person. I, I'm really generous, right? And it's easy to fall into that temptation of giving for the wrong reasons. If others see how much I volunteer at church... They will see how, how great of a Christian I am. Or if my family sees how many great Christmas gifts I buy, I'll be the favorite uncle, All right? If people knew how much I donated to charity, they would really think I was something, wouldn't they? <laughs> so it can be easy to fall into the trap of giving so that you may be lifted up, not necessarily because you're trying to help someone else. So we must consider that humility is a key aspect of Christ-like generosity. 
The second thing we see in this story is this idea of sincerity. The Pharisee, again, is portrayed, obviously, as someone lacking sincerity. He's praying to God, but really the prayer is not about God at all. The prayer is about himself. He says, thank you, God, for me. The prayer is not about God. The prayer is about himself. He probably, well, he did have an open pocketbook. It says he gave a tenth of everything. He had an open pocketbook, but he had a closed heart. When he gave, he probably did so for selfish reasons. He probably did so uh, while looking down on those that he gave to. Saying, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll throw you some money, but thank God I'm not like you, right? And this is just one of many, many stories in the Bible that tell us really one of the most basic principles that we see in the Bible. This is a theme that's just weaved all throughout Scripture. And it's this idea that people make judgments based on what they can see on the outside. But God looks at the heart. This is a theme all throughout Scripture. I mean, it is one of the most foundational, fundamental things we can learn about ourselves and about our relationship with God when we read through Scripture. We make judgments. I make my judgment about Jewel based on what I can see her do. But God can see the heart, and that's where he makes the judgment, right? Another great example of this maybe would be the story of David. If you remember the story of David, Samuel comes into David's house to anoint the next king of Israel. David has seven older brothers, and Samuel passes over the seven older brothers until he finally gets to David. And and Jesse, the father, is perplexed by this, right? Well, I have all these older, more competent, more capable sons. Why would you choose the lesser? Why would you choose the youngest? But this is what it says. The Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God sees through all the fluff, guys. God sees through all the fluff. Other people may not see through you and your outward actions to get to your heart, but God can. God can tell if you're being sincere or not. (laughs) And God isn't concerned with your prayer and how loud it is or how it looks or sounds to other people. He cares about what's going on in your heart as you pray. Are you praying for God's approval or for man's approval? And God doesn't care. He's not concerned with how loudly you sing during service or whether your hands are raised or not or whether you're standing or sitting or jumping up and down. He cares about where your heart is at while you're worshiping. Are you worshiping for God's approval or for man's approval? And similarly, when it comes to generosity, he isn't concerned with the amount of money that you're giving. He really doesn't care about the amount, I'm convinced. He cares about whether or not you're doing it with the right motive, with the right attitude, with the right heart. And if you are, the amount will follow, (laughs) won't it? So when you act generously, whether it be with your money or with your time or with your your energy or with your, uh, your emotions and your relationships, where is your heart? Where is your motive? Why are you doing these things? Are you doing it for others or are you doing it for yourself? That's one of the questions that we come away with. Here's the second passage we're going to look at, the very next verse, Luke chapter 18, verses 15 through 17. And I know these kind of strike you as these aren't verses, passages typically that we talk about generosity, but I hope you'll follow along, okay? The very next verses say this, people were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. Imagine the disciples rebuking Jesus for holding a child in his arms. But Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. 
Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And so, what does this have to do with generosity? (laughs) Well, it appears that the disciples' hearts were not in the right place here, right? They wanted Jesus, apparently, to only be doing things that they considered to be uh, productive. They wanted Jesus to only be doing things uh, that would have a, a payoff in the end. They wanted Jesus to be doing things that were worth it, it seemed like to them. Things that helped them achieve something. They saw spending time with children as a waste of time. What are, you, what are you wasting your time here for, Jesus? Let's go do something important, is essentially what they're saying. But Jesus, he doesn't do that. He stops and he spends time with the children. Why is this? Well, I think the answer is pretty simple. Because he's a generous person. He's a generous person. Generous people do things, not for themselves, not necessarily because it's productive for them, not necessarily because it's going to help them achieve something, or not necessarily because it's going to bring a payoff in the end. They do it out of their love for other people, simply because they love people. Jesus is a generous person, and so he spends time with children. (laughs) You can't measure generosity only by money, I think is another thing we see from these lessons. Generosity is so much more than what we give financially, isn't it? There are so many more ways to be a generous person. There's more than one currency when it comes to generosity. The radically generous people, they will not only be generous with their money, but they will be generous with other currencies of generosity as well, all areas of life. First of all, like we see here in this passage, uh, with your time. Jesus is generous with his time. Think about it. Jesus knew at this point he had a very limited amount of time left on earth. He knows that. He only has a certain number of days, weeks, months, years left. He could have been doing something much more important with his time or much more productive with his time, right? Could have been teaching, could have been healing, could have been off doing who knows what other things. But he chose to spend the limited amount of time he had with children, just holding them and probably smiling and laughing and playing games with them. Another way we can be generous with with other currencies is with, and this is a tough one, okay, our emotional space. We can be generous with our emotional space. This is the toughest for me, okay? We don't mind giving money. We don't mind even giving our time. But don't make me talk to anyone. Please, don't make me get involved. Right? Some of you know what I'm talking about here. I don't want to spend my emotional energy. You notice I said the word spend there because it's like money. It's a different form of currency. I don't want to spend my emotional energy on people. I want to save it for myself. Right? I can't give you that. That's important to me. I have to save that for myself. I don't want to invest in you. I don't want to I don't want to take the time to hear about how your day was going because it's going to drain me emotionally. I just can't do it. Just here, take the $100. Good luck. <laughs> right? Yeah. Emotional space is a very valuable currency. Another form of currency, another way we can be generous is with our physical space. Talking about hospitality. For some of us, our home is very sacred to us. And we don't don't want other people coming into our physical space. Right? I'll help out at the church, but once I'm home, I'm home and, and it's protected. No one comes in without my permission. Some of you laugh because it's probably true for you. Right? So there's a lot of ways that we can be generous without giving money. Right? So generosity is pervasive to all of life. It is a way of life. You can be a generous person in all things that you do. In other words... People who are not radically generous, 
they're not willing to give away these things that are valuable to them. Right? Things that are actually more valuable to them. For many, for many, money is not the most valuable currency. My emotional space is more valuable, or my time is more valuable, or my physical space is more valuable. I'm not willing to give those things away. I'm willing to give my money away, but I'm not willing to give those things away because those are actually what I value the most. This is why it's easy to write a check sometimes but not do these other things because the money is actually not as valuable as the other things. So the sign of a sincere heart when giving is giving away the things that are actually the most important to you, which is why, again, you can give away a lot of money and not be a generous person because you're not actually giving away the thing that's most valuable to you. You understand what I'm saying? So, if you want a picture of what radical generosity looks like, just look at Jesus. Look no further than Jesus. Jesus is a perfect example, a perfect picture of generosity in every way imaginable. When God sent his son into the world, when Jesus came into the world, when he gave the gift of salvation to the world, it was insanely and radically generous. I mean, really, honestly, I can't even wrap my mind around how ridiculously generous it it really is. (laughs) Remember, What's the sign of giving with a sincere heart? Giving away that which is most important to you. Did Jesus do that? Absolutely. God did that. Not only did he do that in his life, again, he gave his time. He gave his emotional space. Think about how draining it would have been for him to walk around with disciples following him and asking him questions 24-7, right? He gave his emotional space for sure. He had thousands of people following him around everywhere he went. He was incredibly generous in the things that he did, but not only that, he gave up even more. He gave up his very life, didn't he? He gave up himself. He gave up the most important thing you could give, your very life. And keep in mind, he gave this gift of salvation to people that he knew didn't deserve it and didn't even ask for it, right? Right? He gave a Christmas gift, a gift of salvation to the world that didn't even ask for it. And not only that, but he knew we could never repay it. He wasn't looking for the payoff in the end. He knew there's no way these people can ever repay me for what I'm going to do for them. No way. No chance. So Jesus definitely gave with a sincere heart, didn't he? But he also gave this gift with a radical amount of of humility. We're talking about sincerity and humility. You want to think about the gift that Jesus gives us. He did it with so much humility. He made himself less than, even lower than, the very people he had created. Think about that. We talked last week about how he's the God of all creation. He made himself less than us. He washed our feet. Our dirty, stinky feet. (laughs) He washed his disciples' feet. He let people spit on him. He let people mock him. He let them kill him. He made himself less than. The creator of all things, sitting on his throne in heaven, came down into the world, made himself vulnerable, gave himself up to pain and suffering and the common cold. He made himself vulnerable to all of these things. And again, even more, in John 1 it says, he knew that his people, the very people he had created, would reject him and kill him. So do you see how crazy this really is? How insane and radical this really is? It's a kind of generosity that we just don't see in the world, is it? saying, I'm going to give you a gift you could never even come close to repaying me for. I'm going to give you a gift you don't deserve. I'm going to give you a gift you never asked for. I'm going to do it because I love you. I'm not going to do it for for the PR. I'm not going to do it as a publicity stunt. I'm not going to do it expecting to get anything in return. I'm going to do it just because I love you. I'm going to leave my throne. I'm going to leave my state of perfection. I'm going to come live in 
among imperfection. I'm going to experience pain. I'm even going to go to the cross and die while you spit on me and mock me so that I might save some of you. You want to talk about humility. Jesus shows that you cannot be truly generous if you don't have a radical amount of humility and love. So, as we think about trying to live more generously, it has to start with humility and sincerity. We have to learn when we give to others not to look down on them. It's easy when we're helping people or helping those in need, helping the needy. That's a nice way of saying sometimes throwing a bone to people that are less than me, isn't it? In our minds, that's sometimes what's going on, if we're being honest. To sort of give and help, but do it with a little bit of a smirk, saying, well, you know, if you... If you would just go get a job, I wouldn't have to help you, right? So we can't look down on folks as we help. We can't think of ourselves as better than others. We must not like the Pharisee. We must not do all these things outwardly while inside saying, thank God I'm not like them, right? Well, that's a lack of humility. Instead, we have to be like the tax collector, believe it or not, at all times remembering that we also are sinners in need of a Savior, just like the person that we're helping. We're in the same boat. (laughs) And we have to do it all for the glory of God so that we may become less and He may become more. And trust that our reward is in heaven. That if we humble ourselves today, we might be exalted tomorrow. As Jesus said, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Let's pray. God, you are a generous God. You gave us a gift that is beyond comprehension. A gift so good we can never fully grasp it, but we can understand it more every day. The more I sin, every day I need your gift of salvation and forgiveness more and more. We need your love more every day. And so we thank you that your love is endless and boundless and that you always have more to give. We thank you for having the humility to come down and do what you did for us. You did not have to do it. No one was pressuring you to do it. You did it because you love us, and we thank you for that. We ask that you help us to learn Christ-like generosity in our lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.